Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Championship Leadership Podcast. We have Michael Lush here today, uh, founder of Replace Your University. What's up, man? Thanks hey, for thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Known each other for several years. So this is the first time on. I know. I can, yeah, when you said to ask. That, yeah, when you said that the other day, it was like, you're going to have me on the show? And I'm like, dang, I haven't had you on yet, have I? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's been a long time coming for sure. Um, well, I like to ask everyone that comes on the show, um, championship leadership is the name of the podcast. So what comes to mind for you when you hear championship leadership? Uh, it's, it's being able to make decisions, um, tough decisions and blunt decisions, not just in the face of adversity, but also in times of complacency and abundance. Um, there's been many a times where I have not shown up as a a championship leader, uh, in the past where I needed to have blunt conversations and just didn't want to upset the apple cart and wasn't clear, uh, on my messaging. And I think that's, that's a part of being a leader is, you know, you're not striving to be liked. You're, you want to be respected, but not necessarily liked. And sometimes you got to have those tough conversations. Um, and, and it's, you know, sometimes we think, well, if things aren't going good, that that's the easier times to have those conversations. And that can be true, but sometimes it's, it's when things are abundant and things are working well, but it could be better that's when it's, you know, I, it, what I find tougher to have those conversations and just be blunt and clear. And, you know, obviously going through your program over the last several years, that's, um, that, that I've definitely gained that skill to the point where people are like, uh, he's a bit of a butthole. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I just, I, I want to get it out there. You're going to know where you stand with me. And I think that's a big part of being a leader. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that too. Um, I was just in Miami and uh, uh, visited a friend last weekend, the week, right the weekend after we were in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. And uh, my boat crew buddy from Kokoro, my swim buddy, um, Manny uh, Mayer, shout out to him. He's a good dude. And uh, he's, he was a Marine and he's been a personal trainer, he's trained pro athletes for 30 plus years and, and has a successful business going. But uh, he was talking about that same thing. He, you know, he was talking about that. He was getting some feedback from his employees uh, just in the, just a few days before that about how direct he was. And, and he's like, what would you, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Would you rather you not know where you stand with me? Or, you, you know, he's like, do you want me to come up and like tickle you before I talk to you? And then like, you know, I don't know what else to do other than just like tell you how it is and where it is. And I'm sure there's, uh, the championship leadership piece to that, I think probably comes in with like having some discernment on, you know, exactly how to deliver that bruntness at times, right. You know, have some tact while, while doing it, depending on the situation. And, you know, sometimes it, you just, it's required to be like, Hey, this is how it is. And this is where we're at. And this is where we're going. Other times, maybe it's a little bit less direct, but still, yeah. With, with what's up. So, um, so why don't you tell, you know, for those that aren't as familiar with you, mm-hmm. um, you know, give us a little backstory on, on yourself, the kind of the path you've taken in life to get you to where you are and uh, definitely um, talk about Replace Your University and what that's all about, what that involves. Yeah, that's not a short story, but I'll try to make it as short as possible. So, you know, Basically grew up in the mortgage industry. It was my first gig out of college, uh, was uh, subprime lending uh, for a large company and did well with that. Everybody did. I think everybody did well in, in subprime lending. But, uh, you know, I rose through the ranks pretty quickly um, from loan officer to assistant manager to manager, to senior manager, and eventually a, a director of operations for the same company. And it was it's funny because, you know, we went through the meltdown. Uh, before I even talk about the meltdown, money, obviously you hear the stories and it's true. Money came in very hot and heavy. Um, lots of it, especially when you're 23 years old, 22 years old. And then my wife, which wasn't my wife at the time, but eventually became a wife. Uh, she was also uh, with the same company. I was in the management role. She was uh, on the loan officer side role and she was one of the top five in the company. So you combine our incomes 
I mean, it, it, no kids, no responsibilities, a dog. That's about it. I mean, we were stupid with money because we assumed this money was going to continue for basically for the rest of our lives. And, and when I say money, I, you know, 50, 60 grand a, a month. Um, and again, when you're 22 years old, <laughs> that's, that's an obscene amount of money. I mean, it's an obscene amount of money uh, regardless how old you are, but especially, you know, back then. And so, you know, did the stupid things that, that a, a young kid would do buying cars, you know, Denali, Escalade, four wheeler, motorcycle, nice house, uh, extravagant vacations and stuff. Um, so we, we did that, but you know, it was on my birthday in 2007. Uh, so December 17th, 2007, when the company finally went under and we saw the signs months before and, uh, we knew it was happening because the, the subprime market basically just dried up. It was like somebody just flipped a switch and said that yeah, we're done. So, uh, they laid everybody off and it was about eight months later. Um, they called me back and said, look, we're going to resurrect again, but this time we're only doing government lending and we want you to head up our national operations. Uh, and I did, and eventually it led into a little bit bigger role, but, um, the, where they got the money to start back was from a hedge fund. And so the hedge fund managers family his mom and dad lived in Nashville, uh, right outside of Nashville. And so anytime he came into town, he would come to my office for, you know, 30, 45 minutes just to stop in and say, hey, and really just check up on his money and, you know, kind of mentor me a little bit. And it was one of those visits where I, I asked him, I said, look, you know, I, what I do, I do really well. You're around, um, at the time, he was upper hundreds of millions of dollars in net worth. Uh, now I think he's a billionaire. And I said, you're, you're around very wealthy people. And that, that's where I want to get to in my career. Um, but here's a strategy, you know, introduce me to those folks, give me that sphere of influence. And when they do mortgages, I'm going to be their guy. There'll be big mortgages because you guys don't buy small homes. So I'll do the mortgages and those are big commissions and big profit. So you get your money back faster. That's when he took about 10 or 15 minutes to explain to me how he actually finances real estate and not just him, his sphere of influence. He's like, we, we don't do mortgages. And I just assumed he was going to say, we pay cash for everything. Yeah. Said, no, we, we still use other people's money. Uh, contrary to Dave Ramsey, um, more air on the side of uh, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. They're still utilizing other people's money because other people's money is cheap compared to what they're getting. For God's sake, he's a hedge fund uh, millionaire. So he knows how to leverage money and make good rates of return. So there's, they don't pay cash for things because when you pay cash for things, there's a lost opportunity cost with that cash. So he said, here's he, what he told me was, and this stuck with me and will stick with me for the rest of my life, is that financial crack, or I'm sorry, mortgages are financial crack to middle America. The poor can't afford them and the rich don't use them. I was like, okay, well, if that's what I do for a living, this yeah. kind of sucks to hear, but so what do you use? He's like, one good tool is a home equity line of credit, the first lien position. And again, he didn't take long to explain it to me. He just said, here's what we do and here's how we utilize it. Um, so actually, one guy that, that's a partner of the company, Matt Workman, uh, he's always been a good friend of mine and also grew up in the subprime days in the mortgage world. So told him about it, said, this is what he told me. I, I'm trying to shoot holes in this. So did that, talked to CPA, actuary. I mean, any of the smartest mathematical people I could I could find. And we spent about a year trying to prove it wrong. And the more we tried to prove him wrong, we actually proved him right. Now, he didn't say this is for everybody. He just said for people that are cash flow positive, um, and you've got a little bit of equity in your house, not a ton, you know, 10% equity, this makes a lot of sense for. So it's not for folks that are living paycheck to paycheck, haven't mastered their budget. You know, right. yeah, those are folks that should go to Dave Ramsey first. Um, and I've got another partner on the bank side that says that this is like yoga pants. Uh, everybody can wear them, but not everybody should. And it's so true. Yeah. But we tried to poke holes in it and, and we couldn't. We're like, holy crap. You know, they're, they're, this has got some substance to it. So it was in 2012. Um, I bought a house and I told my wife, I'm going to refinance this. And you can actually buy a house with a HELOC, a first time home buyer. You don't have to have equity in another property or anything like that. You can actually finance real estate on a first lien position, uh, home equity line of credit at the point of purchase. But I, I didn't do that. I closed on an FHA loan and said, I got to get out of this mortgage insurance. So, you know, here's what I'm going to do. And I explained it to her and she's like, you're nuts. And I was like, just trust me on this one. So we did. And within about three years, we, we had paid our house off. 
So it does work. Um, now, you know, I had a decent income, um, you know, stayed in the mortgage business and was doing well. Um, not as good as I was doing in the subprime days, but definitely doing well. So I had a little bit higher than average income, which allowed us to accelerate it to, to that point. But along the way, I learned a lot of techniques and different strategies to accelerate this because I was just like, I, I, was, I was addicted to trying to see this balance melt away as fast as possible. And I had another mentor on the marketing side that was interviewing me for a mortgage magazine. I forget the name of the magazine, but um, it, it was really boring. He's like, you know, because I was at the time a senior vice president for a federal bank. And he's like, how do you grow branches and grow volume? And, you know, what are some nuggets that we could utilize to train other loan officers and other managers to grow branches and, and develop good loan officers? So we're going through that. And it's, it's, it's vanilla, right? It's, it's not interesting stuff. And then he hit me with one question. He said, what is one golden nugget in this industry that maybe nobody's ever heard of? Is it, maybe there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the, the lending industry, but what, what is, what's out there that, that, you know, would really blow people's hair back. And obviously this is shoot myself in the foot because here I am making a living, giving people mortgages, but you know, on the personal side, we haven't had one in a couple of years. And, I, and I'm already convinced at this point, I'm like, I'm never going back. I'm never going to get a mortgage again. So I explained the strategy and we got off the call and he called me. And he said, I wanted to point out a couple of things. One, that's amazing. I haven't heard of that before. I, I totally see why that would make sense and why that would work. Uh, that's huge for a lot of people who own real estate or want to own real estate. Uh, but two, your energy level was entirely different when I asked you all these mundane questions about the mortgage industry. But then when I asked you this one golden nugget, he's like, your energy perked up. You were excited about it. You were passionate about it. Um, and he's like, I just think you need to turn that into a business. So in 2014, I did. Uh, I abandoned the mortgage industry altogether. And at the time, I was doing a hybrid thing where I told people to get a mortgage and first lien and a, a HELOC and second lien at the point of purchase and then manipulate the, the mortgage balance that way, which can work. Um, but there are some side effects to that. One, you put that bank that you got a HELOC from in a very precarious situation. Um, so it's prone to being frozen. Two, it's just not mathematically as efficient as being in first lien position because you have segregation of income. So I decided to create a business and a course around it. And I said, look, maybe God's got my back. And sure enough, he did. Within 60 days, I was making enough money selling those courses, going around consulting people and speaking gigs than I was doing mortgages. I was like, well, then that's my answer. I'm just going to take it and scale it from here. And that was eight years ago. And now it's kind of developed to at the time, replace your mortgage to now replace your university, where we not only teach uh, the HELOC strategy, but we teach real estate investing. We teach infinite banking concepts through replace your banker, day trading through replace your dollar, and obviously mindset training through, via your course with replace your mindset. So, and now we're, we're about to come out with a six pillar as well in the next 90 days. So it, it's been a fun ride. Uh, definitely has had its challenges, yeah. but it's definitely had a, a lot of rewards too. So that guy giving you that call was kind of the the catalyst to get you to actually create the business, huh? I, I yeah, it just that, didn't that piece of it. Yeah. it. It just didn't sit right. I mean, one, I was more passionate about it. My friends already knew all about it. So here I am in the mortgage business, and my neighbors, my family, my friends are talking. You know, I'm talking to them about what I do personally. And I was just like, but here on the professional side, I'm still slinging financial crack to Mill America. Yeah. I was like, it just doesn't it doesn't feel right. So you know, if I could start a business around this and it put food on the table, well, then I feel better about myself. And that's, that's really how it, it got going. And folks listening, I, I would, uh, I would, I would, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't at this point, just say like, I don't, it, it, you know, you might listen to a lot of podcasts and, and I don't know that there's many podcasts that could significantly change your life forever, but what you just heard, like could significantly change your life forever. If you're open um, and so, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of, uh, replace your mortgage, replace your universe. Obviously, uh, uh, I run the replace your mindset side of things inside of replace your university, but I have a first lean HELOC because of Michael Lush. Um, I believe in it. It's, it's a course, it's a core piece of what I teach at one of my programs called unleash the leader within, uh, from basically the beginning. Uh, so, uh, you know, educate yourself and, um, uh, stay open because every time, Oftentimes when you tell people about this strategy, 
They can't believe it's true. Uh, they just can't get past what they were taught and trained and educated until this point. And so the concept doesn't, you know, it's just like, it sounds too good to be true. And so they never take action on it. And I'm telling you, it, does. it sounds gimmicky. I totally get it. And we still struggle with that today. Right. Um, yeah, sure. and I'll get into the history of how this really developed because I'm not the creator of this, right? This has been around for a right. very long time, centuries. Um, but yeah, I, no different than me. I, I was like, there's a gimmick to this. Yeah. Th this doesn't sound right. And, and just having an open mind and going into it and try to disprove it, really. Yeah. Um, that's what made me a believer in it. And then obviously seeing it for myself firsthand, what it was doing for our financial future uh, was game changing. But, you know, to kind of get into history, this is how we as Americans used to finance real estate yeah. prior to 1913. So a mortgage, which is old French for death pledge, um, was actually is engineered awesome. differently in prior to 1913 than it is today. So prior to 1913, it was almost like a, a home equity line of credit where money could move in and out freely. It was especially popular with farmers that needed to buy equipment. And then what they would do is go down to the bank and say, hey, I need 10 grand on this $200,000 farm that I only owe 100 grand on. Boom, no problem. Here's your 10 grand. And then when you sell the crops, I put the balance back in there. And now my mortgage is at 90 grand. And we always heard the stories of our, our great grandfathers and grandfathers. You know, back in my day, you know, I was able to pay a house off in 10 years. There's a couple of reasons for it. One, they were just a, a better, more educated, disciplined generation. Let's just call a spade a spade. They were. They didn't have internet. They didn't have TV. You know, all it, technically all the advantages or distractions that we have today. Yeah. They didn't have those. So they they were, in some instances, just a better generation. But number two, they actually had better financial instruments than we have today. So yeah. they were capable of paying off their homes and their farms much faster because a mortgage was a two-way street. Money could move in and out freely, just like a home equity line of credit does today. But that changed in 1913. And when I ask people, what do you think happened in 1913? They always say, Great Depression, wrong. Uh, so you're <laughs> off about 20 years uh, or you know, 15. Right. Um, you know, World War I, no, it was the Federal Reserve. And I'm not blaming this on the Federal Reserve, but what the Federal Reserve does for banks is it gives them a backstop. They, they allow banks to execute what's called fractional reserve lending. So now with the Federal Reserve as your backstop, the banks only have to have one-tenth of what you have in deposits. So if you gave a bank, and sometimes it, it, if it's a credit union, it's 15 times, but if you're a bank and you get a dollar, you can lend out $10, right? And if we understand the cycle of banking money, that's a very powerful magic trick. So if you put $10 in, they got 100, you put 10,000 in, they got 100,000, you put 100,000 in, they got 1 million. So the banks looked at this and said, whoa, okay, this is a really cool magic trick. We need more deposits. How are we going to get more deposits? Because again, if you got more money in the, in the savings account or a checking account, the bank has 10 times that amount to lend out. And the more you lend out, the more money that comes back in, it's a never ending cycle. So they got together and they looked at uh, mortgages and said, this is where it's not the mattress that people are putting money under. Uh, they're not putting it in our checking and savings accounts. I mean, heck, it wasn't that long ago, when I say that long ago back then, that they had a run on the banks, right? During the depression and stuff, people weren't uh, comfortable with having all their money in the banks because the bank banks weren't really uh, solvent. So they changed the dynamic of a mortgage and, and made one simple change. They made it a closed in product, meaning money can only go in freely and not out freely. So think about what this does. One, if, if you can't, no one would ever today put 100% of their income into a mortgage. You can a HELOC because it's open in. Money can move in and out freely. So you got the confidence to do that. But nobody would do that with a mortgage. Why? Because it's closed in. Once you put that money in there, it's trapped. The only way to get it out, two ways to get it out, is to refinance, which is costly, thousands of dollars, 30-day, 45-day underwriting, bank statements, tax returns, all this crap, just to get access to your equity. The second way is to sell the house. Well, neither one of those are attractive, right? Yeah. So they made it a closed-in product where money only goes in freely, but it doesn't come out freely. So now what does the consumer do? Well, now they're not going to put 100% of their income towards their mortgage. They're only going to put some of it. And even back then, people were paying extra. Now, 99% of Americans don't pay extra on their mortgage. When I hear this all the time, it's like, well, I'll just pay extra. Really? Have you ever done that before? No, but I'm going to now. 
<laughs> you're like 99% of everybody else. You're not going to pay extra. Why? Because you don't want it trapped in case there's a rainy day. You need access to it. So it's just not going to happen. So by segregating Americans' money, money can only go in and not come out freely. They're leaving money behind. Well, where do you think Americans are now putting that extra money that they leave behind? In the checking and savings accounts where they grow core deposits. And look, I've sat on the board of two banks now. I, I know in these meetings what they talk about. They talk about how do we grow core deposits? And that's how they did it. They did it with a mortgage. Now they're doing it with car loans and student loans and installment loans. All these loans are structured the same way. They're closed in. Money can only go in freely, but not come out freely. And it's designed to segregate you from your cash. Now, here's a byproduct of those um, tools is it now takes you longer to pay off those debts. Well, if it takes you longer to pay off those debts, what do you inev inevitably spend more money on? Interest, which is income and profit and revenue to the banks. So we're a, a HELOC being a two-way street. Money can move in and out freely, just like a checking account. That's why it's become a, a now, a, it should be a foundational tool. It is in other countries. Here in America, not so much. In Australia, look, I, I couldn't make a living teaching this in Australia. This, this is what high school teachers teach in Australia. I couldn't, I can't, 82%, I think is the right number of Australians. This is what they do. This is normal to them. This is normal for South Africans. Ironically, guess who has the highest rate of second home ownership? Australians. Yeah, yeah. Because they can pay off two homes, an average of 14 years, where the average American doesn't pay off one in 30. Why? Because we chase low rates. So this, right now, people are buying houses. They're going to be buying at 5 and 6% because rates went up, right? Well, what are they going to do three, four years from now? Maybe sooner, as the Fed keeps jacking up rates and destroying the economy, they're going to have to do what? The only thing in their arsenal, which is to reduce rates again. So then rates will come down. Now, what are those same consumers that bought a house two or three years ago at 5 and 6% going to do when rates are at 2 and a half, 3, 3 and a half percent like they were you know, a year and a half ago, they're going to refinance. Yep. Are they going to refinance to a 15 or 20? No. Or a 10? No. They're going to refinance to the lowest possible payment. Because as Americans, we have now been engineered and indoctrinated to focus on what fits in our monthly budget as opposed to what we're actually paying for. So if you talk to an Australian, they look at a $250,000 house with financing. They say that two, that's not a $250,000 house. That is now a $310,000 house. However, an American will look at the $250,000 house. Now that they have to finance it on a 30-year term or installment loan, it's really going to cost them $450,000. So you really bought one house for you and another house for the bank. But we don't look at it from that lens. What we look at it as, what's well, a $1,200 payment? I can afford that on a monthly basis. And that's all we care about. Yeah. And we've got to really go back to basics. So but what I'm getting at is I didn't create this. This was something that was a, a, a part of this country way before I was around, way before my grandfather was around, and really just got to get back to basics of being financially independent and financially savvy and not just watching the news and saying, oh, you know, quick and a rocket mortgage has got a, a three and a quarter, 30 year term. Let me go grab that. Oh, it's, there, there are alternatives out there for the right people. And quite honestly, if, if we look back at the last meltdown, if we had a large portion of this population practicing the strategy, we wouldn't have had the meltdown. And the reason I know that is I've also been in a lot of talks with hedge funds over the years because of what we do. Um, we are attractive to hedge funds. Mm -hmm. Hedge funds back then had some paper, not a lot of paper, on first lien position HELOCs. They obviously had tons of paper on subprime mortgages, right? That was part of their, their massive rates of return before the meltdown. So what do you think performed better, mortgages or HELOCs? HELOCs. Mm -hmm. So HELOCs actually had a 115 time lower default rate, first lien HELOCs, than mortgages did. Now, what, what I mean when I say lower default rate, folks weren't late on them. They didn't foreclose. They, they kept making payments. Why? Because they always had 24 seven access to their equity. So when times got tough, some HELOCs you can engineer that you don't even have to make a minimum payment to. If you have access on your line, you don't have to make a payment. They'll just add that to the balance. So what did that allow those folks to do? They allowed them to weather the storm of the real estate meltdown and they didn't foreclose. Where other folks, I can't make this month's mortgage payment. Well, okay, you get reported late. I can't make next month and the month after that either. 
Okay. Well, you're definitely reported late. Your credit score is going down. And guess what? We're taking the house. Yeah. So it's kind of like Joe Pesci. F you pay me. That's the way the mortgage lenders are. Where with a HELOC, it's like, okay, I can't pay. No problem. You got access on your line. And they were able to weather the storm. So hedge funds know that, and they're already in droves trying to buy up as much first lien position paper as possible because, you know, we've, because of COVID, we kicked the can down the road. We've got lots of folks on forbearances and potential foreclosures. Good news is real estate market has skyrocketed. So even though they're not making payments and probably won't be able to catch back up, they could sell the house instead of foreclose because they have so much equity. But um, if that wasn't the case, you'd have massive and rampant foreclosures. Um, And the alternative with a HELOC is I don't have to foreclose. I don't even have to make a payment. Let me just weather the storm. Maybe let me parlay some of my equity into other opportunities. So a HELOC is not just something that can help you in times of need. It's also a great tool when you see opportunities because now you have instant access to equity to capitalize on those opportunities. You know, I had a business partner that had a foreclosure, I think across the street, somewhere in his neighborhood. And he had four days to take tackle that property. Now, if he was going to get traditional lending, he, you don't have four days. It's not going to happen, right? But he had the, his home equity line of credit. So he went to his neighbor and said, look, you're about to foreclose. Let me make you a deal. Let me buy this property from you and I'll rent it back to you. And I'm actually going to give you cash. Uh, as well. And we're going to renovate this property. I'm going to own it now. I'm the landlord, but you get to stay in your property and let's renovate it and get it up to code. So had he not had access to his home equity line of credit, that wouldn't have been an opportunity. Now it became an income producing asset for him because he had access to his equity. And again, in times that you need it, you know, we went through COVID and we probably had a handful of, of students and clients that, you know, either a spouse passed away or they had a major loss of income, right? But they had been a client for a couple of years. So they had access to large amounts of equity. Well, they were no sweat. It's not ideal. The balance is going to creep up over time, but they weren't selling their house. They weren't foreclosing. They weren't missing payments and having bad credit. They were, in fact, some of them, we showed them how to mechanize it. So it became supplemental income. So yeah, you, you lost two grand a month over here. No problem. But let's take this HELOC and let it pay you two grand a month to make up for the, your loss of income. Well, that's really the the next layer of what you guys do, right? And I think that's a, a big part of why you've made the the transition from replace your mortgage to replace your university and showing mm-hmm. them not only how to to get positioned, because I mean, what you guys do is essentially you you educate people on how to on these strategies, on how to implement them, and then really how to take it to the next level with with that equity that they now have available um, mm-hmm. for other cash flow producing um, centers, I guess I'd say, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it became bigger than just a HELOC strategy. And it really, even at inception, it was always bigger than, you know, how do you become debt-free with relative ease, right? And discipline. Uh, even in the beginning, we were teaching what's called infinite banking concepts. But as we started expanding from there, like, okay, we now have access to capital that we can leverage to create cash flow assets, whether it be rental properties or day trading or insurance. Um, then it was like, okay, well, we're, we're outside of this box of replace your mortgage, which replace your mortgage still exists. If you just type in replace your mortgage.com, it'll take you to replace your university, but it, it naturally evolved into a true uh, unconventional university uh, where we teach folks strategies that you're probably not going to hear in school. I mean, I was uh, a a business admin major and marketing minor in college. I didn't hear any of this stuff. None of it. Yeah. Uh, Especially the marketing stuff that we we've learned by building a business and scaling a business. I mean, so don't get me on a tangent of college. Um, I I think it's good fit for some folks. You know, if you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a mechanic or something that nature, something very highly specialized and skilled. No problem. College is great for you. You want to be an entrepreneur? It'd be tough for me to fork over 200 grand now for some of these schools for my four boys to go to, uh, to be an entrepreneur, because really, if you want to, you want to be a good entrepreneur and you got to get in the trenches and you need to learn from people that have already gone through and made those mistakes because mistakes are a hell of a lot more costly than mentors. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no doubt. So what is, you know, speaking to that and speaking to the evolution that you guys have had. So kind of what's, 
and bringing it back a little bit to championship leadership because I know um, I think championship leaders have a, a great vision. Um, it's a bigger vision than a lot of other people can uh, oftentimes see. Sometimes they get ridiculed because you know it's kind of like the HELOC strategy. People can't comprehend it. Mm-hmm. Right? Can't comprehend the vision that you have. Um, so so what is what's that vision for you guys for Replacer University? You know, next five to ten years and and really kind of the impact that you want to make through that. To be a household name, and that's a very lofty goal, is to be a household name. We really do look at it as a mission that we're out there for every, I mean, there are 11,000 banks and lenders out there offering mortgages. So we got a lot of work to do. Most people have never heard of this, and most people are never going to hear this. So we have a massive uphill battle. Um, And that's that's our goal is to, you know, five years from now, it, it when you think of Replace Your University, you're like, okay, this is where you go when you 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 are better than a mortgage, right? I'm smarter than those that are that are getting a mortgage. Um, I want to graduate from high school and now I need to to go into the university side of my financial future and you know graduate to a higher, you know, I, I call it, you know, when you talk about baby steps, Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey, he, he talks to everybody like they're a toddler. Hence, he titles a lot of his stuff, baby steps. And that's fine because there is no sidestepping a budget. This isn't for folks who haven't mastered their budget. You, that's, that's your first step. So for that, he's great. Master your budget. But if you want to graduate from Dave Ramsey and move on to some more advanced strategies that can really get you somewhere uh, at a faster pace with less pain, this is one of those those areas to do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what is a what what might be like a, a critical moment for you, like a fork in the road type moment uh, for you for the business, you know, for whatever whatever comes to mind. But um, I think you know it's twenty twenty two. The pandemic isn't talked about very much as of late, but uh, yeah. you know, coming out of that and a lot of people Amen. were uh, affected, impacted by it and still are. And some, like you say, those days might even be coming. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, what's a, what's a moment for you that maybe they can learn from? I think there's a lot of power in here and how other people have responded. Obviously you decided the way you did, which has you where you are today. Um, but had you, you know, chose a different path could be in a very different place. Mm-hmm. Um, you got, you got a story or two that comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's more of a lesson than I mean. There's so many stories along the way, um, because you know, building a successful business is it, for some people it, it comes easy, and you've got a great product, and I think that that will played to a lot of our success because of the product and the it solves a big problem. I mean, the mortgage industry is one of the largest industries in America, right? So we solve a problem that the mortgage industry is creating. So that helps. And it it also hides a lot of inadequacies inside of your business or being a leader. Um, But one of the lessons that rings true almost daily is, you know, entrepreneurship or or leadership, it it is a skill that you learn over time. It's not something that you're born with. Yeah, there might be some moments when you're an adolescent and you're playing ball and, you know, you're competitive and some of those things, you know, help develop leadership skills. But inside of the arena of being an entrepreneur, uh, you've got to have grit. you got to have passion. You have to really face obstacles and look at it as an opportunity to grow. Um, because if you don't, I mean, some of the stuff that I've gone through, um, I know it looks attractive. You know, it's an iceberg, right? They, they look at, you know, the, the aftermath of being an entrepreneur and having success, successful business like, oh, man, things just come easy for him. No, it, man, there were so many bad mistakes. You were going through a, a big storm inside of your business, right? So, I mean, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, having to get rid of a, a toxic relationship and a, and a business partner wasn't easy. Um, learning the lesson of that that, you know, there was lots of red flags on the, in the beginning, but I didn't have those tough conversations. I didn't have those, not necessarily confrontational conversations, but I, I needed to confront the elephant in the room yeah. that, look, this isn't going to work out. It's not going to work out for you. It's not going to work out for me. And it's definitely not going to work out for the business. We need to part ways. 
Um, I should have seen that early on, but I didn't. You know, I was like, you know what? This business is growing. And, and again, that's why I say when you have something successful, it hides a lot of inadequacies. And he just wasn't a good fit for the business, nor the mission. More, most importantly, the mission. He was, right. this was a moneymaker. This was a widget for him. Hey, uh, this is putting food on my table and then some. Um, I get to go around town telling people that I'm rich. Yeah. And it wasn't about the clients that we were bringing in. Uh, so we lost a lot of focus there. So that, that was a lesson there. But I mean, you've got to have grit and determination. And, and a lot of people that have gone through what I've gone through would have quit a long time ago, yep. a long time ago. They would have folded like a lawn chair. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, what's, uh, is there ever, you know, with what you guys are doing and the fact that not a lot of people know about it, the fact that you know, what you guys are doing, like you said, you didn't create this, it's been around for a long time, but you are definitely educating it and pushing it. And, and uh, one of the kind of the tip of the spirit feels like when it comes to this strategy and helping people uh, through it. Um, you know, it just feels like whenever there's something like this, that like the big banks, because the banks don't really benefit from it, right? The government's definitely not uh, benefiting from it. Do you, do you ever, are you ever fearful that someone's going to come around and, and shut this, this down for people? Or do you see any of that? Uh, the, even if they did, like, for instance, no, nothing on the horizon is uh, going to prevent home equity lines of credit, right? You know, I remember when Trump passed the 2018 tax law, I'm like, oh, that's it. HELOCs are no longer tax deductible. Well, when, when you sift through the documentation in the IRS bulletin, you actually find the opposite. Um, so I remember, you know, when that happened, it's like, oh, great. Well, hold up. Are you trying to be debt free or financially free because you got massive tax benefits because you have massive leveraged debt on your home? No. So even if it wasn't reversed, and when I say reversed, what we came to find out about the true tax law when it came to HELOCs, it's like, that's not the goal. I'm not going to go into debt just because I get a tax benefit, right? Yes, you can buy real estate because real estate has massive tax advantages to it, but you're also buying that real estate for all the other reasons, right? The cash flow that is produced by having rentals or the, the cash revenue profit from flipping houses. You know, so there's all uh, kinds of other benefits that come along with those tax advantages. You don't do it just for a tax advantage. Like if I bought a property and just sat on it, it didn't do anything, it didn't appreciate, but I got a tax deduction, there's no financial gain there. Right. Um, the other gains are, you know, appreciation, uh, writing off depreciation, you know, the rental income, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing on the horizon that says, all right, we're going to do away with HELOCs. What we do that's different from the others. So there are other entities out there that came along way before me that teach a second lien position strategy. That does make banks nervous. Because when you go through a 2008 and 2009, when you're in second lien position, there is no guarantee that the bank gets any of their money back. But in first lien position, you protect the bank. And when you protect the bank, you protect yourself. Secondly, this is a sticky product. So we also educate banks as well. It's another part of our business. We're not just educating consumers. We're also educating banks of why this should be consumer friendly and bank friendly. Because when you get a HELOC in this, you're engaging in this product multiple times a month, not a mortgage, where a mortgage, you just set an auto payment, and then you never talk to your loan officer again for two or three years or ever. Yeah. Um, and then they sell the paper. So you don't even have a relationship with the, the, the entity that you originally got the mortgage from. With this one, this sits on the bank's balance sheet. So for a bank's perspective, this is a very sticky product. This customer is engaging with us multiple times a month. So now the banks have opportunity to solicit you for some other financial products, whether it be credit cards or deposit accounts or CDs or money markets or insurance products, et cetera, and, and refinancing or renewing your HELOC. They have those opportunities because you're, you're always top of mind to the consumer. So, and not, not to mention when it comes to a, a mortgage, mortgages are sold on the secondary market for a premium called a yield spread premium, where a HELOC is constant reoccurring revenue, albeit it's slow in the beginning. It's not nearly as profitable as a mortgage. But if they keep that customer for five to seven years, now they start making the same revenue as they were on the mortgage because they're getting the interest income from this. And we also teach consumers, or not consumers, but clients, you know, when you get a HELOC and you've got massive equity and you see an opportunity, 
utilize the equity that you have in your home. It's an asset. So go tackle that cash flow asset, not the liabilities, not a car, not a boat, things of that nature. Unless, I mean, there, there's some pretty creative ways that people have made money on that too, but utilize your equity. So what does that do? Okay, well, the balance goes back up. Now the interest income for the bank gets higher. So, because uh, there was a concern, especially with the hedge funds early on that, well, these people are paying their homes off so fast. We don't have an opportunity to make any income off of this. I'm like, eh, no, it, my clients are utilizing their HELOC and leveraging it to go buy more cash flow assets. And what they're doing, let's say you got a hundred thousand dollars worth of equity and you're buying hundred thousand dollar properties. Well, how many properties can you buy with that hundred thousand? Most people would say one. Well, no, we're not paying cash. We're, we're going to finance those properties too. So we're going to chop this $100,000 of equity into five down payments, and we're going to go buy five properties. So now they got five rental properties. They just started their own real estate portfolio, right? Well, what do you think happens? Well, they're not going to rent it, the property for less than what they pay. So they're going to rent it for more than what they pay. So what happens to their cash flow? It goes up. Well, what do you think happens to the HELOC as cash flow goes up? It accelerates the pay down. Yeah. Now, what do you think that consumer is going to do when they've paid it down another hundred grand? Go get five more properties right. yeah. and then five more and five more and five more. So it creates a really, and once you get to past 10, well, now you got to talk to the bank about it, getting a commercial line of credit for your portfolio. Hey, the bank wins there too. So again, this is something that can be beneficial, not only to the consumer, but also the banks. And so for the banks that uh, are with us on the first link position, they love it. And it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So I don't see that external threat um, from the company uh, in this market. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know we're running up on a little bit of a uh, time for you. So we'll wrap this up. One last question. Um, you know, if there's one or two things that you could share with the listeners that if they were to apply today, it would help move their life forward today. What would that be? Change your mindset. It's what you do for a living. Um, yeah, I've said it, yeah, I've created replace your mortgage, um, and replace your university, but none of that would have been possible had I not had the appropriate mindset. Yeah. Everything starts with the foundation of having a strong mind and that's what you do. And, you know, ironically, you know, as I'm going through your program, uh, three years ago and into where I am today, we've seen where I've had to go through a valley. Yeah. where times were tough in the business and had to get rid of some toxic relationships. But that's where the mindset came in. It, it helped me get through that. And then now as we're riding the wave back up again, well, what is it? I mean, just like in, in December, I forced my whole crew to go through ULW because it's that important. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life is to strengthen my mind. So you can go and get financially educated. You can, you know, to do a lot of things, but you're always going to face some type of adversity, uh, especially when you try to become successful, whether that's from friends or family, they're jealous or envious, there's going to be some adversity. And if you are not prepared and conditioned to walk through, jump over, go under or around those obstacles, you're not mentally prepared. And it's, it's not as simple as just saying you need to be mentally strong. You've got to put yourself into in some very uncomfortable positions time and time again, because your brain is no different than any other muscle. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be conditioned. Um, you know, I remember the first night three years ago, you know, I wasn't prepared to go through what your program can physically put somebody under. And I, you know, running and cardio was something I was scared to death of. And <laughs> Sure enough, I wasn't prepared and pass out running. Yeah. But yeah. you know, I I I I hit that that wall. And you know, you guys talk about you're 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 really operating at 20% capacity. And it's not until you learn how to push through that wall, which is a skill that you have to learn. It's not going to come naturally because your brain is like, you're going to die. You need to stop. Yeah. Why is my brain telling me this when I only have 20% capacity? Because that's all I've ever operated at, uh, aside from being an athlete in the past, but as an adult, I've been, you know, sitting on the couch watching football and instead of doing things that I should be doing. So my brain is telling me you're outside of your comfort zone and this is not good for your health. Unfortunately, what your brain is doing is it's lying to you. Again, you're only at 20% capacity. And what happened when I pushed through that wall? Well, the rest of the week was a cakewalk for me. I was like, you can't throw enough at me. 
Um, you can't hurt me, <laughs> as Ted Coggins will say. Right. You know, give me more because I'd like to see what I'm really capable of. Yeah. And it's cool when you it's it's like a runner's high. It's it's a euphoric when you get that opportunity to, to just push past those barriers. You're like, it, this is just a metaphor for physical activity, but this crosses over to business, to relationships and everything else. And if I'm capable of doing this just in this week, what am I capable of doing if I do it every single day for the rest of my life? So much yeah, more. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, and you're definitely going to need that, you know, for you listening uh, to take advantage of these strategies, because it's going to, it's going to conflict so much with what you think, you know, uh, but if you can break through it with that mindset, um, telling you, as Michael's seen it with many, 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 many of his clients, uh, life is significantly different on the other side. So appreciate you being here, man. Uh, Thank you. What are appreciate some ways they can go and, you know, cause you have all kinds of incredible free content out there. Just yeah, to- just go to Replace University and you, you'll see all the pillars of what we teach there. Um, start with one and go from there and tons of free content, lots of videos, lots of books that you can read and things of that nature. So just, just go to replaceyouruniversity.com and then hack away. And I don't share this enough, but, uh, you know, share this episode with, with folks. Cause like I said, this is probably one of the most important episodes I've, I've done. I feel like they could really, really, really make a difference for people if you take it and implement it. So share this out to everybody. I appreciate you for being here. Uh, thanks, man. Thanks. Appreciate it, buddy. Bye-bye.